One of the things I think has been really interesting about putting our two networks together is we expose each other to a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. Uh, because we actually travel in fairly substantially different circles in some different parts of our lives. I mean, there's the hedge fund and you know financial mm -hmm. services that you're doing. Mm -hmm. There's a set of the kind of the entrepreneurial uh, not-for-profits like Endeavor and Kiva that I'm doing. Although Premol was from yes. PayPal from yes. both of us. Okay. And um, you know, one of the key things is where is the next massive entrepreneurial talent going to come from? And you know, one of the things that I think is interesting is that. Technically, you'd think, well, it's human ingenuity. It can be from anywhere in the world. But one of the reasons why I think focusing on just a couple areas is I think good entrepreneurs move to where they need to be in order to mm -hmm. start interesting companies. So, you know, if you're thinking about doing a consumer internet company and you're not thinking about moving to Silicon Valley, that's a... That's a red a, flag. That's a red flag. Similarly, like if you if you wanted to create film and you're not <laughs> moving to either LA or New York, you come here, that's, it's... It's a, it's, it's definitely a flag. If you're going to politics, you should go to DC. If you go into finance, New York, movies probably still LA, yeah. and and tech is Silicon Valley. So I think that, um, you know, part of the thing when you're looking for the next tech geniuses, it's how do you attract them to come here? It's not that they're necessarily born here; they might or may not mm -hmm. be. And then when they, if they do come here, how do you find them? And uh, part of what I think has made Silicon Valley such the capital of innovation, even with amazing things we see happening in China and everything else, is uh, the fact that the, the talent still comes here in order to do things. Well, Silicon Valley is a very open place. It's very fluid. You know, there's always this question why Boston failed hmm. as opposed to Silicon Valley, because in the 80s, I think Boston was probably on par with Silicon Valley in terms of tech companies being created. And I think, uh, you know, this is sort of a minor legal detail, but you have I never sign non-disclosure agreements. Mm -hmm. And it's always assumed that you talk about things, you share ideas, maybe you can take them, maybe you don't. We build a relationship, and maybe we'll figure out a way to work together. And not that things are sort of um, vertically compartmentalized in all these, uh, all these strange ways. So I think Silicon Valley has an aspect that's, that's very open, very fluid, um, and, uh, and it helps tremendously on these cutting edge ideas. You want to be in the place where you can talk to as many people as possible about your ideas mm -hmm. um, because that's the way you will know that they're cutting edge and you will improve them even more. One of the interesting theories I've heard about here is that part of the, the whole ecosystem is if you're actually in the top set in Silicon Valley, you're the top set globally. So one of the things that you get as regional advantage is because you know what the bar is as yes. you're trying to figure out what to do. And then the network helps you. You have to be the best worldwide to have a chance of competing. Maybe there's some local variants around language and things of that sort, but those are really the exceptions to the rule that um, the best uh, technology company tends to win on a worldwide basis. Yeah, one thing I think is interesting, I'm still bullish on the thesis that there are three internets. There is English, Chinese, and then everything else. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is how the three of those will shape up, because mm -hmm. I think it's definitely true that all the technology is global, but I think the rules, for example, in China and in English are completely different. Yes, I would, I would bet on the English internet being the most important going forward because mm -hmm. we seem to be at a global tipping point where English is becoming mm -hmm. the, uh, the worldwide language. Um, and so if I had a rank, and then of course, um, as an English speaker, um, I I'm sort of feel like myself almost limited to, to focusing on the English internet as the one that I can invest in and in best position to do things with. Well, I certainly agree that I think that the English is the one that has the broadest across countries and the kind of the global effect. And it's partially because, you know, I always am entertained by this phrase, but, you know, English is the lingua franca. 